between 48 Woodstock Road and its point D on the map on the back of your, your handbook and the door code uh, which will disappear slightly uh, is the door to the, the outside world so only the first of you uh, will need to use that code to get in and in the evening the cottage bar is situated at J on the map which is almost at the opposite corner of the map to D um, so you can see where that is um, I, I will be around to ensure that you can get in to the, the short paper sessions at the start of this afternoon Andrew over to you so, let's just get rid of this It's with great pleasure that I am able to introduce Professor Timothy Chappell. Um, he gave a very short, succinct autobiographical statement. He read classics at Oxford and took a PhD at Edinburgh. And he's currently Professor of Philosophy at the Open University. His most recent books include Ethics and Experience and Values and Virtues. And part of the reason I invited him, I wanted to get someone who could give a, a, a contemporary look at the philosophy specifically of persons and work being done by, by philosophers uh, in this area. So please would you welcome Professor Timothy Chappell. Thank you. Well, I'm not entirely sure that the paper I've actually written has fulfilled that brief, because a lot of what I say here is quite historical. Um, however, what I want to notice is a certain kind of convergence between views. And the convergence in question is a convergence between a way of thinking about persons which has been historically important and some lines of thought which are becoming prominent and important now. There is a handout which I hope you can see. If you can't, it's not crucial. I hope to talk my way through the paper and make everything as clear as it can be. For the sake of a little continuity with um, David Papineau's and Barry Smith's very interesting contributions last night, um, I want to start by saying that I have no objection at all to what either of them was saying, um, although in some ways, as will become apparent, I'm the kind of person who the press would put on the other side of this kind of debate. I have no objection at all to materialism presented as David presented it as a thesis about what things are made of. I just don't think, and I'm not convinced that David does either, that what things are made of is all there is to say about things. I think there's rather a lot more. And on Barry's paper, again, I found myself intrigued and sympathetic to a lot of what he was saying. Because the question that Barry was answering in the affirmative was, can neuroscience help us understand ourselves? And I see no reason at all why that shouldn't be true. Indeed, I think Barry demonstrated that it is true by example. The thesis I would want to contest is a much stronger thesis, the thesis that only neuroscience can ever help us to understand ourselves. And the more I listen to papers on this kind of topic, the more I'm unconvinced that anyone serious in the area really holds any such view. Unfortunately, what happens in culture at large is that a kind of iconoclasm of the person develops. People take a certain perverse glee in undermining their own high ideals about themselves. They think that they're unmasking illusions. A lot of the time, I'm not convinced that is what's going on. But people seem rather to enjoy the game of saying, I am nothing but a machine for genes or a bag of neurons doing their thing. It's an interesting cultural question why people find this kind of iconoclasm so appealing. And the phenomenon, I, I think, is really rather sad in the way that iconoclasm usually is. A great deal of damage and destruction wanton damage and destruction is done in this process 
alongside what was the original intention, which is to clear away a few bits, a few bits of useless bric-a-brac. What I want to suggest in this paper is that if we want to understand what persons are and some things about the person-brain relation, then it's not just to neuroscience that we might look. And this is what I'm doing here. I'm looking in another direction. I'm exploring some historical arguments. How do we know when or if we're inter interacting with persons? What is knowledge of persons? And what is knowing persons like? I'm going to answer that, to put it very crudely, with some Wittgensteinian epistemology and some Levinasian phenomenology. Wittgenstein's well-known in the Anglo-Saxon world. Um, Emmanuel Levinas, except among his devotees, perhaps not so much. If I can convert you to an interest in Levinas today, then that's one positive achievement. Our knowledge of persons, I'm going to suggest, is a hinge proposition for us, as in, in the famous words from the investigations, part two, subsection four. I'm not of the opinion that he has a soul. It's not a hypothesis I hold about him. It's something that, in a way, precedes the kind of level of certainty that we might be talking about. We talked about things as opinions. So our knowledge of persons is a hinge proposition for us. That's the Wittgensteinian bit. And what this knowledge consists in is the experience that Levinas, perhaps following St. Paul, as quoted above, I, I had a bit from 1 Corinthians 13, but the... Uh, computer didn't like it, so I cancelled that. It's the bit that says, um, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Central to Levinas' philosophy is the idea of the face à face, the confrontation, um, the coming together of two foreheads, that's what confrontation means. Um, the presentation of two persons to each other as persons. Direct and unmediated encounter between persons. I'm going to suggest that that is what it's like to encounter persons. And there's a bit from um, Totalité et Infini. This speaking to the other, this relation with the other as interlocutor, this relation with an existent precedes all ontology. It's the ultimate relation in being. Ontology presupposes metaphysics. If that's unintelligible now, I hope to have unpacked it a little by the end of this talk. Um, the basic idea is that the key words here, I think, are this relation with an existent, an existent in italics. This isn't on the handout, by the way. Before you even do ontology, Levinas is saying, before you even do any theoretical investigation of what exists, you're already in a relationship with someone else. It's in that sense that it precedes ontology. The, this relatedness to others is primordial. Ontology presupposes metaphysics. And for Levinas, these are both very loaded terms. Crudely and quickly, ontology is bad. Metaphysics is good. Metaphysics is a humble pilgrim's journey into an unknown and very large world. Um, ontology is the attempt to suppress differences, systematize, turn everything into one um, cube of knowledge which you can simply swallow. Levinas is rather interested in eating. Okay, so in a contemporary writer, we have these two thoughts in effect put together. And this is the third quotation on this page, which again is not on the handout. Sorry about that. There are only two pages. And I, I kept writing this paper up until I arrived yesterday. You never really stop Running a paper, writing a paper, do you just run out of time? No sane person, this writer says, can take seriously the suggestion that our knowledge of other minds is merely hypothetical. However weak our evidence that others have minds may be, it's outrageous to suggest that we might give up our commitment to the minds of others. That my wife and children are thinking, feeling beings, that a world shows up for them, is something that only insanity could allow me to question. Our commitment to other minds is not really a theoretical commitment at all. Our commitment to the minds of others is a presupposition of our life together. That's the Wittgensteinian bit. 
In this respect, the young child in her relation to the caretaker is really the paradigm. The child has no theoretical distance from her closest caretaker, caregiver. The child does not wonder whether mummy is animate. Mummy's living consciousness is simply present for the child, like her warmth or the air. It's part of what animates their relationship. Mummy's mind and baby's mind come to be in the, I don't like this bit, but never mind, coochie-cooing directness that each sustains towards the other. And the writer here is Alva Noe in his wonderful popular book about contemporary philosophy of mind, um, Out of Our Heads. So the claim is that there are two ways you can look at persons. Individualism is one of these, and this is on your handout. For the individualist, the individual is the presupposition of relationship. You have to have individuals before you can have relationships. For the relationalist, it's the other way around. You start off with the relationship, and it's out of the relationship that individuals individuate themselves or are individuated by others. I take it when Noé says, as just quoted, that um, mummy's mind and baby's mind come to be in the directness that each sustains towards the other. I don't think that that's metaphor. I don't think Noé thinks it's metaphor either. He means what he says. He means that this is how minds are constituted. This is how individuals, individual persons, are created by this kind of relationship. So I'm not very good at visual images. If there was an icon, interesting word, for this talk, it probably would be a Madonna and child. And if you think about that image, as this paper progresses, the reasons for that may become pretty evident. So my thesis is a bit like John Donne's. John Donne famously says, no man is an island. I want to argue that no human starts out as an island. Each of us at least begins as a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Insofar as we ever come to be anything like entire of ourselves, this is a learned and socialized achievement. And it's achievement, moreover, which is necessarily built upon our prior status, a status as parts of the main. Now, the individualist tradition has things exactly the other way around. It says each human is an island, at least to start with, and that it's only later, if at all, that we learn to build bridges to other islands. Relationality for this tradition presupposes individuality. It takes individuals to be prior, both in the order of analysis and in the order of genesis, whereas relations are subsequent engagements entered into or not by these already existing individuals. That's individualism about persons. And I'm arguing against that and for relationalism about persons. An obvious thought, by the way, about these two theses is that maybe it's not just one or the other. Maybe it's a bit of both. Maybe there's some truth in individualism and some truth in relationalism as well. I'm perfectly happy with that, um, a bit of this and a bit of the other response. What I want to insist is simply that the relationalist side of this picture has, generally speaking, gone missing in the way we think about philosophy. And I'm inclined to suggest um, in my right on moments that there's a touch of androcentric bias about this. If more philosophers were women, then it would be less obvious to people that individuals just spring up out of nowhere, perhaps out of some goddess's forehead or something, rather than what every mother knows, which is that an individual emerges as a process of nurturing, literally at the mother's breast, and later at the mother's knee. What kind of theses are these two theses, and what kinds of arguments can we offer for them? Well, we could offer, them, offer arguments in developmental psychology, as Alva Noe does, as already cited, and as Kenneth Kay does, and this is on the handout, so I, I needn't read it through, if you can see the handout. In The Mental and Social Life of Babies, How Parents Create Persons, which is a wonderful title. Um, it's a miracle, Kay says, that the kind of creature a man and a woman can bring into the world becomes the kind of creature that possesses a mind and a sense of self. Brains alone couldn't do this. It takes sociality as well. This comes back to my thesis that what things are made of is not necessarily 
the whole story about what things are. Later on, Kay says, we reject the view that enf infants enter into a social contract only after their development as cognitive isolates. And we reject the view that the newborn has all the social impulses that define our species. The human infant is born social in the sense that his development will depend from the beginning upon patterns of interaction with elders. He doesn't enter into that interaction as an individual partner. Infants only become individual partners gradually as a result of those interactions. So we could go the way of developmental psychology. Some contemporary philosophers will think that develop, some developmental psychologists will think that this is the only way to argue for these theses. I, I dispute that, as we'll see from my procedure. People might be inclined to think that at any rate it's the best way, and they might be right about that. Nonetheless, I'm going to do something different, something less good, if they're correct. As well as these being theses in psychology, individualism about persons and relationalism about persons are clearly theses in the philosophy of mind. Um, and so I could advance the argument by taking that line. I'm not going to discuss contemporary philosophy of mind in quite that head-on way or quite that systematically. But I do think that what my argument shows, relevant, relative to the theme of the conference, is that persons cannot be the same thing as brains. Theses like these can also seem to be theses in metaphysics. And these are views about what persons are. But the case I want to make for relationalism and against individualism doesn't deploy the kinds of argument you most often get in thoroughly modern metaphysics. This isn't an argument that, um, this isn't an argument about person fission. It isn't an argument in the Parfit style. It isn't an argument about what we need to suppose in our best and most um, uh, economical ontology. It's not about what science mandates us to believe in. It's not about the law of identity in the kind of way that concerns David Wiggins in Sameness and Substance. I'm doing something different. I'm starting with experience and reports of experience. My project here is phenomenological. In a sense, you could call this experiential or applied metaphysics. That's the way I'm going to be going. So the thesis I'm advancing will at least be argued for by phenomenological methods. It is, as I say, a thesis in the philosophy of mind, a thesis in developmental psychology, a thesis in metaphysics. It's also, and this is important, a thesis in ethics. I'm getting more and more interested in the philosophy of mind at the moment because it's finally dawn on me, dawning on me, far later than it should have done, of course, just what an ethical subject philosophy of mind is, how much there is of ethical interest there. In this question, what are persons? In this question, what is a mind? How do we relate to the world around us? How do we perceive? How do we get to be conscious? All of this seems to me to be deeply ethically loaded material. And for someone who comes to philosophy of mind from ethics like me, that adds to its interest. But now here's a bit from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And you've got this on your handout. That great philosophical resource. There's just been a collection to plug Nicholas Joll's collection. There's just been a collection on the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy brought out. Many, many millions of years ago, writes Douglas Adams. Perhaps I should do this in the, in the Peter Jones voice. A race of hyper-intelligent pan-dimensional beings got so fed up with the constant bickering about the meaning of life, which used to interrupt their favorite game of Rocky and Ultra Cricket. Rocky and Ultra cricket, cricket sounds to me a lot less strange than the kind of cricket we play. But anyway, that they decided to sit down and solve their problems once and for all. And to this end, they built themselves a stupendous supercomputer, Deep Thought, which was so amazingly intelligent that even before the data banks had been connected up, it had started from I think, therefore I am, and got as far as the existence of rice pudding and income tax before anybody managed to turn it off. Now it's that last bit, that wonderful conceit of this computer, which even before it's fully going, gets all the way to rice pudding and income tax from the cogito. That's the bit I want to concentrate on here. Because that is a wonderful description of a certain kind of rationalist power fantasy. 
And it's a power fantasy which I think is characteristic of individualism about persons. The fantasy is that one mind all on its own, if it's clever enough, can build an understanding of the world out of nothing but its own contents by sheer deductive horsepower. A priori, in advance of the data, and so on. The cleverer you are, the better you'll be at this. The further you'll get beyond your own head. What the tale of deep thought expresses, or more likely satirizes really, is individualism about persons taken to the nth degree. And it can't be an accident that the intellectual odyssey of this fine computer starts with the cogitor. For the picture just sketched is, in an obvious way, Cartesian. According to one standard summary, Descartes' view is a paradigm of individualism about persons. On that summary, his view is that if we leave aside groundless and unreliable prejudices, then reason teaches us that each of us starts, like deep thought, in the solipsistic predicament and has to cogitate his way out of that predicament. So each of us is an individual and a reasoner before she ever reaches a shared world. And she only does reach a shared world because she's an individual and a reasoner. Getting beyond our heads is a feat of inference, deduction, interpretation. There's a, a wonderful bit in Monty Python about, um, I don't know if you know this bit, I, I was chasing this and couldn't find it on the internet, about Inspector René Doughty Descartes, whose um, approach to the whole of life is um, Sherlock Holmesian. The, the phone appeared to ring in what looked like the corner of the road. Inspector Descartes had the sensation of approaching it. He appeared to lift it up. Descartes here, he posited. Um, so there's a kind of weird philosophical fantasy of our relationship to the world here, which I think is a fantasy. This is the individualist fantasy, and this is what I want to oppose and undermine by reference to some historical sources for experience, reports of experience, phenomenology. So that's the Cartesian view, or the Descartes or Descartes' view, or at least that's the standard summary of his view. I think there are reasons to doubt whether that is what Descartes actually thought, and maybe I'll have time to go into them in detail. At any rate, we can call the view Cartesian. At any rate, we can say without any controversy that it's very influential. It's the picture from which a thousand modern philosophical discussions of the problem of other minds and our knowledge of the external world have started. Just Google those two phrases, and you'll see what I mean. And it's routine in these discussions to assume that the picture from which we start is not just Cartesian, but Descartes. So it comes as a surprise when we start reading Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations. I tremble somewhat to discuss these texts in this company, but never mind, let's have a go. Um, it comes as a surprise that Wittgenstein doesn't start with a quotation from Descartes. Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein starts with Augustine. He quotes Augustine, Confessions 1.8, and here's what he says about the quotation. These words, it seems to me, give us a particular picture of the essence of language. The individual words in language name objects. Sentence are combination, sentences are combinations of such names. In this picture of language, we find the roots of the following idea. Every word has a meaning. This meaning is correlated with a word, and so on. This is on your handout. Now, this is the application, I want to suggest, to the case of language of the individualist and Cartesian picture of mind described above. A baby learns its own first language by playing charades with its carers. The adults say a word. The baby has to guess what the word means from the context. No doubt the cleverer the baby, the better it will be at making such guesses. A baby with the intelligence of deep thought would be phenomenally good at this game, whereas the rest of us have to struggle along and only get to learning Akkadian and Proto-Melanesian by the age of four. The words in question, as Wittgenstein stresses, are primarily nouns, and within the class of nouns, they're primarily the names of concrete particulars. And it's immediate, ob immediately obvious, as a flaw of this picture, that it doesn't have an account of how other words than nouns might be learned by the baby in the guessing game. So that's the individualist picture of language learning, and hence of mind more broadly that Wittgenstein's attacking. Is it the picture that Augustine is attacking? Well, on your handout, you have the quotation which Wittgenstein gives from Confessions 1.8. I quote it there in William Watts' quotation from the Lerb, which isn't quite the translation you get in the English edition 
of the philosophical investigations. In the German, Wittgenstein simply quotes the Latin. I think the English edition translation is by Anscombe. Um, I quote a different translation simply to shed a different light on the same text. So what does this passage, which is on your hand, I, I won't read it out, what does it tell us? The first sentence certainly tells us that the infant Augustine learned to correlate nouns with things by observing how adults correlated nouns with things. Does that mean that Augustine's committed to the particular, pic particular picture of the essence of language that Wittgenstein wants to attack? The picture on which meaning just is thing-noun correlation and language learning just is the detection of such correlations. And the point of that picture, as I've argued, is that it's the one which emerges from a more general individualism about mind. Is Augustine committed to this picture? No, he isn't. And actually, Wittgenstein doesn't quite say that Augustine is so committed. And if you look at the rest of the quotation, not just the first sentence, you'll see why Augustine is not committed to meaning as thing, noun, correlation, and nothing else. The second sentence that Wittgenstein quotes um, is about uh, how we come to understand others' meanings and their intentions by seeing and understanding not just the noun thing correlations that they go in for, but the whole set of their bodies, the whole bodily demeanor behind those correlations, which constitute what Augustine calls a kind of natural language of all nations. And what Wittgenstein might call, oh, sorry, or as Wittgenstein might have expressed this, the human body is the best pitch of the human soul. We get to understand what people mean by looking at what they say and the thing noun correlations they go in for in the context of their behavior. The third sentence of the Wittgenstein, sorry, the third sentence of the Augustine quotation is about how habituation into any language is not granularly bit by bit. It's not atomic, learning one thing noun correlation at a time. It's a holistically cumulative process. Um, little by little, I by little and little collected, Augustine says. Um, or as Wittgenstein might have said, the light dawns gradually over the whole landscape. All in all, this Augustine quotation is strikingly Wittgensteinian, I suggest. If we assume that Wittgenstein's purpose is all out attack, then this quotation clearly doesn't serve that purpose. Perhaps we should surmise that what Wittgenstein is doing here is not so much setting up Augustine in order to knock him down as displaying Augustine's account as one which is generally interesting and plausible, even though it includes or suggests the commitments that Wittgenstein most think, thinks most need questioning. And Norman Malcolm does tell us that Wittgenstein revered the writings of Augustine and that the decision to begin the investigations with this quotation from the Confessions was not because Wittgenstein couldn't find the conception expressed in that quotation stated as well by other philosophers, but because the conception must be important if so great a mind held it. So Wittgenstein doesn't think that dealing with Augustine is just about the patient and rather patronizing connection, correction of gross and benighted error. It's tangling with a serious and interesting mind which goes in all sorts of different directions. And as we look at the context, as we look more widely at Confessions Book One, we begin to see that for Augustine, the key con precondition of language learning is not so much cognitive as conative. One way to establish this is to look at the quotation that I, the second Augustine quotation I give in the handout, which comes from immediately before the bit that Wittgenstein quotes. Unless a baby, Augustine fairly explicitly tells us, has the kinds of desires and impulses that human babies typically do have, one crucial prerequisite of its induction into human sociality will be missing. It just won't be the right kind of creature to cotton on to those sorts of sociality. And Augustine's point in his description of how he learned to speak in Confessions 1.8, his point is, is, that, is that because he did have the desires and impulses that babies typically have, and because he was surrounded by human beings living a characteristically, form of hum characteristically human form of life, it's because all of that framework was in place that it was possible for him to become a member of the linguistic community. So overall, the picture that Augustine's confession gives us is a picture about being, as the normal phrase has it, always already within a framework, within a certain background. It's only against that background of a shared form of human life that Augustine 
can achieve linguistic linguisticality, can achieve the ability to speak languages. And against that background, of course, there might be thing, noun, correlation, guessing games of the kind that Augustine describes in the one bit that, all, that Wittgenstein quotes. But it's only the background that gives sense to these games. And that is precisely the point. The point in confessions, the point in the whole of the confessions, one of the key points, is that Augustine finds himself in a situation and in relations not of his own making, but which have been passed on to him and in which he finds himself standing. As an aside, you might wonder whether thing noun correlation could ever be such a surgically laboratory style exercise as it's sometimes supposed to be. Um, you do get thing noun correlation guessing games in real life, but whenever you do, they're always, if anything, more grist to the Wittgensteinian's wit mill, I want to suggest. And there's a nice example of this in Patrick Lee Fermor's book, Rumini. Patrick Lee Fermor is traveling in northern Greece. He's completely fluent in very demotic Greek because he spent the war as a partisan in Crete. So he can speak Greek all right, but he comes to a village where there's an obscure dialect. And these villagers engage Patrick Lee Fermor precisely in a guessing game, in trying to work out thing-noun correlations. And here's what Fermor says about it. The alien and the un-Greek ring of these wild syllables filled me with wonder, as though each villager, as a word was uttered, was throwing a strange object on the table in a mysterious and insoluble kin's game. A few were immensely familiar, the linguistic equivalent of rusty pen knives, bus tickets from vanished lines, flints from a blunderbuss, glove stretchers, a broken church wall. What is a church wall? I don't know. The cat's whiskers from a crystal set, a deflated million mark note, the beer label from a brewery long bankrupt, a watchman's rattle. For more and his villagers are dealing exclusively in nouns. And there's, a, so their guessing game is a game of thing noun correlations. But the whole point of the game is that a whole way of living comes with these correlations. One that Fermor does not know, as I don't know what a church warden is, and that the villagers do. Even to understand, even this supposedly most basic and simple part of their dialect, we need also to understand an entire world, the world of the dialect speakers. A language presupposes a form of life at every point, even in its most straightforwardly referential parts, even in its thing now correlations. So Wittgenstein and Augustine are allies on the issue that we're discussing today, and which I've been discussing so far, because Wittgenstein does, with specific reference to the case of person, sorry, with specific reference to the case of language learning. The point in Book 1, Chapter 8, is that the kind of constitutive dependence on others that I've been talking about holds in the case where those others are other human beings. And Augustine spells out the point by focusing particularly on language. More often in the rest of the, of the Confessions, of course, the point is that this constitutive dependence also holds, and holds preeminently, in the case where the other in question of God. Augustine says in a famous passage that he's loved God late, and he means in comparison with when God has loved him, which is, he thinks, all along, from the beginning of his being, and indeed from before that. And God, in loving Augustine, he says, has been present in him and to him, even when he was not present in or to himself. As he puts it, God has been closer to him than the closest part of himself, and further above him than the highest he can know. This isn't just rhetoric. This isn't just verbal twiddles. This isn't just done to impress other people, Augustine is making a claim about what he thinks he's experienced. The claim is that when he reflects clearly, what he sees in his own consciousness is the categorical and unquestionable presence of God, and at the same time, and in contrast to that, the conditional and questionable presence of himself. Um, you, O Lord my God, he says in Confessions Book 10, you are the one in whose eyes I have become a question to myself. There's something riddling and uncertain about his own being, which is brought to light by God's being. There's something in a man which even the man's own spirit in him does not know. But you, O Lord, who made him, you know everything of him. Therefore I will confess, as in confessions, what, to you what I know of myself. And I will confess to you what I do not know of myself. So the story in the confessions is that any mind always finds itself not only in relations which it didn't set up with other human beings, but also in a relation which it didn't set up 
with God. And as I say, this for Augustine is a phenomenological claim. It's a claim about experience. So the picture when we, that we get when we look at Augustine's narrative as a whole is that he's a relationist about persons and language, like Wittgenstein, not an individualist about persons and language, like the Cartesians. What's primitive is never my awareness of myself. What's primitive is a relationship of awareness between me and others, and above all, between me and God. I start off as a piece of the continent, a part of the main. It's only by first being a part of that main that I later learn to be an island in Tower of myself. Well, hang on, you might be thinking. Surely one thing we know about Augustine is that he invented the cogito. He got there before Descartes. And the cogito, as we saw from the case of deep thought, is paradigmatically a move that the individualist about persons makes. It's the first step on the way out of the locked-in syndrome that, according to this kind of Cartesianism, we all start in. So how can Augustine be a relationalist if he starts with the cogito? Well, he isn't. He presents his form of the cogito, the si fallo sum argument, the argument, if I'm deceived, then I am, in at least three places. The fullest discussion is in the city of God, and that argument explicitly sets the argument in the context, sorry, that version of the argument sets the argument in the context in which I think Augustine really always wants to propose it, whether explicitly or implicitly. The context is the idea that the human mind is structurally parallel to the divine mind. We recognize within ourselves the image of God. Um, the image of God is an image of the Trinity. Um, it's an image of the Trinity because we exist, and we know that we exist, and we love this existence and this knowledge. And the idea is that the three words italicized there, exist, know, and love, are supposed to correspond to parts of the Trinity. Now, exactly how the correspondence goes is something that Augustine isn't completely consistent about. That doesn't matter for our purposes. The purpose that I, the, the point here, is that what Augustine's offering is a doctrine of what makes mentality essentially social. For Augustine, there is no lonely, solitary mind. To be a mind is already to have relations of some sort within, whether those relations are relations of knowledge or of love or of both. For Augustine, the more internal relatedness there is within a mind, the truer a unity it is precisely by being, in this way, internally related to itself. And at this point, it should be fairly clear why Augustine makes so much of this thought in De Trinitate, how well his philosophy of mind equips him for defending the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. So it's only against that background, only against the background of the claim, that there's a systematic parallel between the structure of our minds and the structure of God's mind, that Augustine comes to the sea fallow sum. And this is how he makes the move. In these three things that I've mentioned, existence, knowledge, love, there's no falsehood resembling the truth of disturbers. For these things are not like external realities. We don't grasp them by any of the bodily senses. Without any image making within the mind, it's most certain to me that I exist, that I know that I exist, and that I love my existence and my knowledge. For these truths, there is no threat from the academic arguments that ask us, but what if you're mistaken? For if I am mistaken, then I exist. That's where the argument comes for Augustine. It's not the very first move in his philosophy. It's a move that he makes at a later stage where he has to combat a particular kind of skeptic. The background is precisely not the Cartesian background of the solitary thinker deducing his way out of his solitude like deep thought. First, mentality is essentially social. That's one reason why. And secondly, this essential sociality of mind is something that arises in us only because each of us starts off in relation with others. Each of us becomes an individual mind only by being always already in relation with other persons. As Augustine thinks, persons both human and divine. Personhood, in short, is not something I achieve on my own for Augustine. It's a gift. It's the gift to me from other, of others. And hence, to enact the si fallo sum is not to announce my own solitariness. It's to express what only that gift could have made me capable of expressing. So there we are. 
that's a reading of Augustine as a relationalist, despite his use of the cogito. I'm saying that the fact that Augustine uses the cogito doesn't disrupt the overall picture, which I want to say is true of him, that he is a relationalist, and that therefore he is no opponent of Wittgenstein's. He is, in fact, broadly on the same side, at least on these issues, as Wittgenstein. A question you might wonder about here is if I say that about Augustine's cogito, am I going to say the same about Descartes' cogito? Am I going to say that Descartes too is in fact a relationalist? How far can I push the argument? Um, perhaps I'm queuing myself up to argue that Descartes isn't an individualist either, that the standard account of his views is all a mistake too, that he too is a relationalist. Well, I don't think that's quite what we should say, but I do think some of it's right. For all the utter familiarity of the meditations, we can be surprised by a rereading. We expect to find the meditations, because of the way we've been taught the meditations by and large, we expect to find it narrating the individualistic, deep thought-like odyssey of a solitary mind, out of solitude, into a shared world, with nothing to help it but its own brilliantly ingenious powers of reasoning. That can be what you find in the meditations, especially if it's what you're expecting to find. But we should ask ourselves, what did Descartes expect his readers to expect to find? His own culture was far more aware of Augustine as a cultural presence than we are today. Antoine Arnaud, in the objections that he put to the meditations, pointed out that the influence of Augustine was all over Descartes' text. But that was hardly something that needed to be pointed out to Descartes' contemporaries, and it was something that Descartes himself was perfectly well aware of. Um, I just quoted Augustine distinguishing between what's known by reason and what's known by sense, about the place of phantasiae and phantasmata in the story. Remarks like those and plenty of other things in Augustine were bound to sound extremely Augustinian to Descartes' intended readership they would have found it entirely obvious to see the meditations as an Augustinian essay on knowledge. To be sure, with updates to bring Augustinianism into line with the best Renaissance science. The fact that today we can't even see this Augustinian framework of illusion is no evidence that it isn't there. His contemporaries saw it, and they understood at once how Descartes' frame of reference deliberately and studiedly subverts his text's ironical pretension to be presuppositionless. That's a pretension that today is routinely taken with complete literalism. I suspect we should be a little bit more suspicious in our reading of Descartes. I'm not saying that the reading of Descartes, um, the deep thought reading of Descartes, as we might call it, is wrong. What I am saying is that it needs to be balanced with other possible readings. If we are to see the par this paradigm of philosophy, so take the meditations to be, in anything like the way that Descartes means us to see it. The usual way to read medita the meditations now is just asking simply, what can I know? I'm not saying that's wrong, but I am suggesting that it's not uniquely right. Another way to read the meditations is an inquiry, as it were, into the epistemic problem of evil. God's good, and a good God cannot be a deceiver. Yet there it is, there's deception in the world. How does that happen? How can we avoid being deceived? Reading the meditations that way may begin to move Descartes towards relationalism and away from individualism. How far does it move him? I think for his contemporaries, it would have moved him pretty well all the way. They would have known from what he explicitly said that there was an Augustinian and relationist context for his thoughts. For most modern readers, however, we're not going to see that background. We're simply going to miss it. Augustine's well understood as relationalist because for him it's only within the framework of a pre-existing relatedness to God that any truths at all can be discovered by the individual person. At first sight, Descartes doesn't seem to share that outlook. But to, to, to borrow a distinction from Aristotle, I think that's more a difference in the order of discovery than in the order of existence. Descartes' thesis is that beginning from the individual mind and what clearly and distinctly appears to it, we can think our way not only to God, as one of the objects that appear to the mind, but also to God as the source of the clarity and distinctness with which any object so appears. So Descartes' Lumen Naturale really is no more and no less than Augustine's Illuminatio. Um, 
As its name is meant to suggest, it's the same thing approached differently, as it were by ascent from below, rather than by inspiration from above. So Augustine and Descartes really are close resemblers in their approaches to truth and understanding. But is God actually a presence to Descartes in the way that he clearly is to Augustine, or again to Descartes' much younger contemporary, Blaise Pascal? I've said a lot about the differences between Descartes and Augustine, but here surely is a big difference. Sorry, about the similarities between them, but here's a big difference. Augustine's full of direct address to God. There's nothing like that in Descartes. In the meditations, Descartes does not talk to God as a person. He talks of God as a notion. He talks to other humans, never directly to God. Well, I think that contrast is a real one. And I think the reason why we get that contrast is because Descartes, as well as being an Augustinian, is also trying to be a scientist. He's trying to be objective about the preeminently subjective. Whether that's even a coherent project is a question which many critics have raised. For example, Descartes. Um, and perhaps it's a point that Augustine too would have raised. Maybe Augustine would have wanted Descartes to be less scientific. Perhaps Augustine would have said that there can be no third personal detached describing of what's lived as engaged second personal experience or not known at all. And Roger Scruton seems to be having something like the same sort of thought when he writes, um, explanation by cause and effect involves the discovery of law-like connections between events. Subjects have no place in those laws, not because they're mysterious or supernatural, but because they only exist for each other. Physics gives a complete explanation of the world of objects. That's what physics means. Physics, as I might put it, is about what things are made of. God is not a hypothesis to be set beside the fundamental constants and the laws of quantum dynamics. Look for God in the world of objects, and you won't find him. Perhaps that, or something like it, is what Augustine would say to Descartes' attempt to be objective about the subject. Well, I don't want to pursue that any further here. What I've done so far is suggest that things are not quite what they often seem, and that two thinkers who are often set up as paradigm um, individualists about persons are actually, actually better read as relationalists about persons in some respects. And I'm, I'm sure of that thesis in the case of Augustine than I am in the case of Descartes. But I think there's something to it in both cases. Emmanuel Levinas, in his reading of Descartes' Cogito, goes a lot further towards reading Descartes as a relationist than I've gone here. Um, Levinas is a wonderful philosopher who ought to be read more. We read, I think, too much Heidegger and not enough Levinas. If we've only got one slot and neither of them has to occupy it, I think it's time for Levinas to do some occupying of that slot and Heidegger to move over. Um, Levinas is all about the face-to-face, -face, as I already said. The face-to-face, -face, he says, is the foundation of language. The face brings the first signification. It establishes signification itself in being. Language does not only serve reason, but it is reason. The first rationality gleams forth in the opposition of the face-to-face. -face. And again, language institutes a relation irreducible to the subject-object relation, the revelation of the other. In this revelation only can language as a system of signs be constituted. The other called upon is not something represented, is not a given, is not a particular, through one side already open to generalization. Language is what makes generalize, genera, generality and universality possible. It's not some of the presupposes. Language presupposes interlocutors, a plurality. The subtitle to Totalité et Infini, Totality and Infinity, is Essay sur l'extériorité. It's because Levinas believes that real understanding necessarily comes to us from outside that he thinks we should be concerned with exteriority. We're always looking for something beyond ourselves. It's not within, it's not from within that knowledge comes. It's from our encounters with others. And so a key con concept for Levinas is enseignement, which is the straightforward French word for teaching. But it also means, if you translate it bit by bit into English, insignment, the inscription of signs into, well, into what? Into the mind, perhaps, into the soul. Enseignement, insignment, comes from others. 
teaching comes from others. It's others who induct us into a system of science and of understanding. So Levinas is, um, you might say, the paradigm relationalist. He's the great philosopher of the second personal in the 20th century. And that's partly what got me interested in him. I was reading a wonderful book by Stephen Darwin on second personality. And he mentioned Levinas rather briefly. And uh, so I, I went and had a look at Levinas. And I think Levinas is an absolute goldmine. If one is interested in claims like relationality about persons, um, relationalism about persons, the claim that we are in relation with others before we ever get to be individuals. So the key to the meditations for Levinas is the passage, the, the little hymn of praise, the little um, doxology that Descartes sticks onto the end of Meditation 3. And I, I haven't got time to discuss this now. But the point that Levinas sees there is that the Cartesian cogito is discovered to be supported on the certitude of the divine existence qua infinite. Even the cogito comes down to God's gift to Descartes, according to Levinas. Um, even in the cogito, it's the awareness of God which is primordial. So Levinas reads even Descartes as a second personal philosopher. Um, I don't want to go that far myself. What I do want to notice is how um, Levinas, how interesting it is that Levinas can read Descartes this way and that Levinas can bring Descartes into the camp as well as someone who takes relationality to others to be prior to individuality. Right, let me sum up. What I want to draw from this historical discussion um, is a number of points. First of all, I want to get on the table, I want to get into the discussion, the possibility, the mere possibility of relationalism about persons, the mere possibility of thinking that individual, individuality emerges from relationships that we stand in before we are individuals, rather than it being the other way around. That's my first object in this talk, to get that um, idea on the table. My second object, and this is what I'll close with, is to note the ethical implications of the kinds of things I'm saying. There's an approach to persons which is very common in applied ethics. And the approach is to, you might call it the, the checklist approach to personhood. And this is, I think, the dominant approach, so much to so much so that it's pretty well the only approach. People like Peter Singer say that we have a checklist of properties which you have to display if you are to count as a person. And that unless you can put a tick by emotionality, language, reasoning ability, tick, 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 and the rest of it, you don't have a person in front of you. Now that, it seems to me, is a very individualistic about persons, way of thinking about um, whether we should count someone a person or not. And to say why I think that, I'm going to close with another quotation from Alva Noe. Here's what Noe says. This is on page 33 to 4 of Out of Our Heads. I can't both trust and love you and also wonder whether in fact you are alive with thought and feeling. Just as I cannot dance well if I'm counting steps and trying to remember what comes next. A certain theoretical detachment is incompatible with our joint mutual commitment. It's not that our commitment to each other's consciousness is beyond rational criticism. The point is that for a person's mind to be thrown into doubt for us doesn't mean that we've lost the evidence we once possessed that assured us from a standpoint of theoretical detachment that the other was mentally present. That is a standpoint that we never occupy in relation to other minds or that we occupy only rarely in exceptional circumstances. What's thrown into question is what our relationship to the other should be. The question of whether a person is in fact a conscious person is always a moral question before it's a question about our justification to believe. Even to raise the question of whether a person or a thing has a mind is to call one's relation to that person into question. And this is the point. For most of us, most of the time, our relations to others simply rule out the possibility of asking the question 
For the question can only be asked from a detached perspective that's incompatible with the more intimate, engaged perspective that we actually take up to each other. If relationalism about persons is true, then this checklist criterial approach to persons is not just false, but incoherent. It takes as a criterion of personhood what it only makes sense to treat as an ideal for personhood. But the evidence is increasingly strong that relationalism about persons is true. Relationalism is what fits the realistically world-centered and embedded thinking, of which Levinas is a prime example in the phenomenological tradition, and Wittgenstein a prime example in the Anglophone tradition. It fits an increasingly large mass of data from developmental psychology, and it fits um, a lot of new work in the philosophy of mind of action. If this emerging consensus is right, um, then applied ethics has a lot of catching up to do. For mainstream applied ethics continues to be firmly wedded, I think, to individualism about persons, and to a strikingly shallow and implausible form of individualism about persons, too. Thank you. waiting until you, the microphone reaches you, I, I'd be grateful. The gentleman there, fourth row back. Um, uh, Simon Blackburn. Um, thank you, Tim, for that. Very interesting. I didn't quite understand the opposition between relationalism... It's working. Yeah. yeah. Uh, between relationalism and which you like, of course, and criterionism, was it, or cri use of, a, use of criteria. criteria. Yeah. Um, I just wondered whether the opposition is quite as stark as you think. I mean, suppose you've got somebody whose um, display of personhood is waning, somebody, say, with Alzheimer's uh, dementia. Um, it seems to be perfectly reasonable to let I mean, and even granted that the question is going to be, how should I relate to this person or not person? Um, even granted that, it seems quite reasonable that the, um, uh, the, the, the subject who's thinking that or wondering that um, should, if not use a checklist, which has a pejorative tone about it, at least look for things like whether they can remember things, whether they know who I am, whether they are capable of managing their own life, uh, and uh, various other things which might occur to one as symptomatic of gradual loss of personhood. So I don't really see the opposition between relationalism and uh, the use of what you call a checklist, but I think more mutually you could call criteria. I just wondered if you could explain to me why you see those as opposed. It depends what the checklist is being used to do. Um, and there are two very different things you might do with a checklist like that one of which I think you're describing and which I'm not opposed to, and the other of which um, doesn't emerge from your description, but which I am opposed to. The thing I'm not opposed to is saying, of some person, this person now has uh, diminished capacities. This person is clearly ebbing. It's, it's very sad. Grandpa is losing his faculties. Um, and we have to adjust our treatment of Grandpa to the fact that he, Grandpa, is losing his faculties. That, I think, is a perfectly legitimate thing to do. What I find immensely disturbing is the kind of talk that you get from people like Peter Singer, which says something rather different. It doesn't say, how shall we treat this person, given that he is losing various sorts of pers personal capacities. It says, rather, is he a person at all? And I find this talk about persons and non-persons, which people like Singer engage in, frankly, rather sinister. And I, I think the moral implications of such talk are nicely brought out by the, the Noe passage I just, let, I, I just read. And I, I, think that, I think that what you describe is fine, but I think what Singer does with such lists, or apparently does with such lists, um, is, is very different. I guess several at the back. Um, I think the gentleman may be on the left there, and then there are three at the right. Yes, yes. Stay with me. Just wait for a moment to get the microphone. Thank you. Uh, 
friendly question, perhaps not even a question, a, a suggestion. So you talked about relations in, in, in connection with ethics, but I wondered if you thought about it in connection with decision theory. Uh, there's, there's a strain of thought in decision theory which argues that if we think of the decision problem facing a number of people, not as it's done in normal decision theory, think of the prison, I mean, everybody thinking, what should I do? Rather, a team of people think, what should we do? Absolutely. Then they can rationally arrive at decisions which aren't, aren't available from the point of view of a number of separated individual decision makers, even if they're, they're motivated to pursue their own interests. Still, collectively, they can achieve things that individually they can't. I think that's an absolutely wonderful connection, and um, I, I think that's a very friendly suggestion. I, I really want to pursue that. Um, yes, I, I think that it, it simply hadn't struck me before you said that, David, how um, what I'm saying here could indeed be applied to things like the, the hoary old prisoner's dilemma and other, the, the tragedy of the commons, various other problems for collective decision, where if we got away from the individualism that I've been attacking, we might see these things in a completely different way. Incidentally, um, just to um, wave a red rag in case there's anyone, any bulls in the audience, um, the, you, you might be wondering on the ba basis of what I've been saying so far, so, so if it's not Descartes who's the individualist, who, who is the individualist? Um, the answer to that is Hobbes. Hobbes is the villain of the piece. So if, if there are any Hobbesians who want to come out fighting for Hobbes, then that would be interesting. But, but yes, I, I love that suggestion, David. Let's pursue it. Thinking about it in its evolutionary context, it's perfectly natural uh, to human beings, uh, imagine the situation that I exist in space, to think, what should we do? That would be much more advantageous to them think about what should I do. It's, 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 it's a natural way for humans to think, and we, we find that ourselves all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm very happy with um, shedding evolutionary light on this. As, as I say, my, my motto is always, let a hundred flowers bloom. Um, if, if evolutionary thinking can teach us something about cooperation, then great. Um, though, as, as I said right at the beginning, what I want to resist is the idea that once you've got the evolutionary story, that's all there is to it. I think there were three at the back. I think Ray had a question. And the... Yes, the other side, sorry. I very much enjoyed your talk, and it really made clear to me why Levinas, as it were, turned the history of philosophy on its head by saying that ethics is the first philosophy as opposed to epistemology. But I wonder whether the ethical contribution now of the philosophy of mind, which you alluded to, will be simply to recover from its own history. Sorry, say again. That the only ethical contribution or the contribution to ethics that the philosophy of mind can make, which you alluded to, will be actually to recover from its own erroneous history. <laughs> Yes, although, um, as I say, I think there are bits of the history which are less erroneous than they're often supposed to be. That, that's why I, I spent so much time on the case of Augustine. Um, I, I, think, I think we all of us, including me, are, are too prone to think in sharp oppositions where actually there are alliances that can be forged. Um, but yes, it's for sure that there are plenty of mistakes in the history and that they need unpicking. Um, I didn't introduce myself yesterday, so Philip Hauer is from Humboldt University in Berlin. Um, I was wondering, and at one point you said uh, you, you're also fine with the bit of both picture of individualism and relationism, yep. but a lot of things you said uh, sounded to me as if you were, wanted to say individualism is just false and relationism is true. Yep. And uh, if you say relation, the relation presupposes or, or is presupposed before you can get an individual, it seems to be a, a stronger claim than to say it's, it's a bit of both. So I was, I was wondering in the end how, how much you, know, you, you are actually supporting that balanced picture. Yes, that, that, that's a fair challenge. Um, I wanted to um, get that possible objection out of the way, I suppose. Um, and I don't want to ignore the possibility that there can be a kind of dialectical process. Um, in fact, I'm absolutely sure there is. Um, and the dialectical process is a process between recognizing your relation, relatedness to others and 
recognizing your own individuality because part of what the relatedness to others is about is precisely that others um, treat you as an individual. So there already there is this kind of dialectic. And maybe dialectic is an important word in this and I should have another look at Hegel on this subject. Um, but, but yes, there is some sense in which I want to claim that if, if anything is absolutely primordial, I'm a little bit suspicious of phrases like that, but if anything is absolutely primordial, then I think it is the relatedness and not the individuality. Lady yes. Um, sorry. Sorry, yes. yes. So you, you first, and then the lady there. Yes, sure. Sorry. Um, to Blanche Dalport, I'm from the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Um, and I, you know, I find the, the use of Levinas very interesting. Um, I have a question in relation to that. Um, Levinas talks about the hypostatic moment in being called out of the, the ilia, or that there is, um, through the face of the other that you, that you mentioned. But um, I think also what this gentleman said is, what I find interesting there is that does Levinas then, would you say Levinas then proposes say an original subject that is able to call you, um, to call you out of the ilia? Uh, Levinas speaks um, specifically about the face and the, and the meeting of the faces. Can it possibly be that Levinas talks about an original subject and if not then one can one can look about look at the concept of a flat ontology, the fact that objects can actually also call one out. It not, does not necessarily need to be a subject, um, in, you know, but for Levinas it's the face. So yeah. my question, will, would it be possible that one can become a subject or be called into this hypostatic yeah. moment without the interaction with another subject, the relation with the, with right. the umwelt in that way? Well, there are lots of reasons why that's an interesting question. Um, one reason is because, um, of course, everything I've said so far about individuality presupposing relationality is bound to raise in everybody's mind the wolf child question. What about someone who is raised totally on their own, own and without any kind of social contact with other human beings? Um, how would they get to be a person? Would they get to be a person? And my answer to that is, is simply, I don't know. Um, another reason why it's an interesting question, um, I promise not to say I don't know about this, or at least not very much, is because it, it raises the question, I think it raises the question of Levinas's relation to Heidegger. Because in Heidegger, it does look a lot more like um, the, the basic encounter with the world is, so to speak, me object, rather than me you. Um, for Heidegger, what seems to be primordial is the encounter with equipment, um, with the stuff around you, which you do things with. Um, and Levinas is um, pretty fanatically anti-Heidegger. That comes out in lots of ways. Um, there are obvious personal and biographical reasons why someone who had been imprisoned by the Nazis during the Second World War and had neighbors die in the death, sorry, had relatives die in the death camps. There are obvious biographical reasons why someone like that would not be terribly um, keen on someone who flourished under the Nazis. Um, but it, it would be get, good to get beyond the level of, of personal venom, obviously. Um, I think for Levinas, the relation with the other is primordial um, and not the relationship with equipment for a reason which has to do with, um, I think probably the, the notion of teaching comes in again here. It's from others that we learn how to negotiate the world around us, how to negotiate the equipment in the world around us. Um, and if one is thinking of play equipment and a mother, um, every parent teaches their children to play with the toys that they buy them. I've certainly done this. And so in that sense, perhaps, the relation can be seen as uh, prior to the relationship to stuff, to things in the world. And if so, I think Levinas is strongly inclined to say that that's one up to him and one down to Heidegger. Um, I think he may be right there. But one thing I simply don't know enough about is um, w what Heidegger has to say about our relations to others. I need to know more about that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the lady there's been waiting to do a question. Yes, just down, just here. And then he's right, I think it's one at the back. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed 
enjoyed your talk very much, thank you. Um, again, this is maybe a bit of a helpful suggestion um, for that sort of relational core individual approach, that general approach, you would expect to find help coming from uh, the leaders and the various places that you registered. But here's a place that maybe you wouldn't expect to find it from. It might be good for the woman uh, if you're not wearing it. most recent book, which was this year, uh, last year, Plato's Camera, um, he delineates more clearly than he's done in all the previous work, that I've ever read, um, three levels of learning, and I'm not sure if he calls them levels now, three, three sorts of learning, of which the first um, is what he calls the sculpting of the brain um, across in suggests that the evidence there is that what we are doing when we are very little, when we are infants and just beyond, is that we are actually learning the relation, the relational, before we are learning the individual. Yeah. So we see the relation between things before we see how to describe them. Yeah. It's a very interesting report, but perhaps one yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, indeed. Um, I take it that what we have here is a thesis about plasticity of mind um, and the way in which it actually turns out that in order for uh, creatures like us to be able to see the world has to make a contribution and that the classic experiment which shows this um, Alva Noe reports it um, is that uh, kittens were light deprived for a crucial period in their development and because they were light deprived for that period um, their brains did not develop in the right way for them to be able to see. So because there was no light coming to them, they turned into cats that could not see. So the world makes an essential contribution because the mind is plastic, because um, the world shapes the mind as the mind develops. Um, the world and mind co interact with each other and differentiate the mind as something that can perceive the world. Without that worldly contribution, no perception. Um, well, that's a kind of thesis about relationality. I, I guess it's a kind of relationality rather different from the kind that I'm talking about here. But it, it's certainly interesting, um, for apart from anything else, for, for reasons to do with scepticism. It's Peter next. Yeah. 
all over the place and in mythology where we're so preoccupied with the with the power but knowing the real name of the thing. Yes. The theme of the Cratylus. That's, the, that's what he's trying to get at. And he picks on Augustine not because he knows anything about Augustine's philosophy. He didn't read the history, he didn't read what Augustine's actual theories of that were. Uh, but he just found in the unreflected or relatively unreflected passages in the uh, in the confessions uh, the rudiments of the picture he wanted to pick up. Right. Thank you. Um, okay, to take those points in turn, I read uh, Martin Buber, Ich and Du, about two years ago, and was frankly very disappointed. Um, I think it's a great subject, but I, I read the book, and I mean, the, the, if I was writing a rude book review, I would describe it as mystical theological vaporing. Um, it, it just doesn't get clear enough about what's actually being said. Um, <laughs> I think it's, as, as I said, I think it's a nice idea. I went away and I looked for someone else talking about the same theme of second person relations. And I came across Levinas and I thought Levinas did the same thing far better. Um, it's true, of course, that Levinas too writes in a rather obscure and a very elevated and at times quasi-mystical style. Nonetheless, Levinas actually has substance to him. And I, I, found, I found in Buber, beside the basic idea, not enough substance. Whereas Levinas, I'm, I, I know a good deal less than a tenth of what I'd like to know about Levinas. That's a rough estimate. Um, second question, what am I doing? Um, well, I'd like to know that too. Um, I, I, if I'd done this off my own computer, my, my children gave me a, a picture of a Labrador in a laboratory tipping various tubes of acid into its coffee and um, the, the, uh, the line at the side reads, I have no idea what I'm doing. And my, my children seem to think that it's important that I should have access to this picture and be able to display it on my computer at all times. Um, what am I doing? Well, I am trying to do more the second thing of the two things that you suggested, which is that I am trying to engage in phenomenology. I'm trying to say some things about the general structure of experience um, that we have or that others have reported or that we might conceivably have, or that might in some sense express the limits of, of what's possible for humans to experience. So the enterprise is basically phenomenological. Um, but if what I say about the phenomenology is true, then it had better show up in developmental psychology and philosophy of mind and metaphysics and other places too, and ethics as well. So um, yeah, that's that question asked. Now, the, the third issue, the, the um, exegetical issue, um, I'll just make one comment on that because um, I, I know when to come out with my hands up. But the comment I will risk is this. I think if, if Wittgenstein says in um, section 32 of part one of the investigations that it is with Augustine's child as if he's learning a second language, I think that's just wrong. I, I don't think that's true. I don't think that when you look at the description, it, it is like he's learning a second language. Um, why not? Because, well, in the first place, I'm not sure that I think that the difference between learning a first language and a second language is as radical as Wittgenstein might be making out there. I think it depends how you learn your second language. But the best way to learn a second language is actually to learn it as you learn a first language, by immersion. You simply take yourself off to a place where speak, people speak German or Swahili or whatever, and you try and do what they do. You try and live as they do. And by doing that, that's how you get hold of a language, which is very different from sitting down with a grammar book and learning some thing-noun correlations. But it does depend how you learn a second language. Oh, just quick, one, one quick response. Okay. Um, what Wittgenstein has in mind is that you, you can't look at child uh, language learning as learning the names of things. In order to learn the name of a thing, you have to know a hell of a lot about, lang uh, about the grammatical background. Yes. It's not a matter of you know, correlating the word table with the object table. And that's why he says it's like a child who already knows the language, knows the general grammar yeah. of bits of furniture. Yeah, say. yeah. And then knowing what thing that the adults are referring to can be the, the handle you grasp. Yes. That's not possible for the child learning his first language. So that's an important point. Right, OK. But, th but then we're pretty much on the same page, aren't we? Because we both agree that a great deal of context setting is necessary before any of this stuff can happen. Yes. I think Thank was you. Was it Murray at the back? I think. 
Um, uh, Murray Shanahan, Imperial College. Um, so I just wanted to press you on the wolves, and I'm sure you don't want to be pressed on the wolf child because you said uh, you, you don't know. I'm happy but to be I, pressed on it. I, you um, you uh, might not get much back. <laughs> I just wondered to what extent the, uh, the wolves can be counted as others, uh, despite the fact that they're not language using, and, and therefore whether there's any sense in which you, you need to separate out language use and the presence of, you know, of some you know, other kinds of creatures, because yeah. clearly the wolves will in some sense have taught the wolf child uh, a lot about its environment, how perhaps, you know, how to uh, you know, find food and so on. I want to go completely empirical at this point. Um, I, I think there are reports of actual wolf child, child cases in the literature, um, and I want to look at them and think carefully about them and, and say, well, right, if, if there's anything in these cases that definitely refutes the kind of picture of personhood that I want to set up, then my picture is wrong, and I will simply abandon it and start again. Um, but what I know of wolf child cases, little as it is, is nothing that refutes that. It seems from what I've read about them that wolf children are typically, well, pretty wild. Um, they don't have any capacity to speak. They um, react to people um, along the lines of the, the four Fs, pretty normally, um, they find it very hard to <laughs> relate to human beings until they change. And by coming into contact with humans, I mean, here's one problem with all child cases. As soon as they come into contact with the humans who capture them and take them away from the pack, they become something else. But on, on the broader issue of whether wolves can be others with a capital O for us, well, of course they can. And so can all sorts of animals, um, despite the fact that they don't have language in the narrow sense. I, I should say, incidentally, that I think that Levinas, when he uses the word language, langage, et totalité, et infini, he's using it in such a broad way that you might almost call it cheating. It's um, language symbolic behavior. It's everything we do that would interest an anthropologist. It's all of our social and acquired and acculturated behavior. It's not just words. It's a much wider notion than that. And wolves, of course, have that too, as do dogs. A dog can tell me perfectly plainly that it wants to go for a walk or that it wants affection or whatever. I have time for one more question. Um, I think maybe, uh, if I missed my, I think it's the gentleman at the back was probably first. So. Um, I think it's quite refreshing to have brought into this discussion about persons and brains the question of human birth, growth, development, because that seems to me that's a, an unavoidable part of our biological nature and um, surely must be the beginning of what um, is meant by uh, us being persons, because we're as, as human beings, we're not um, born and nurtured because the same is true of other animals. But we're born into a language using community um, with a culture, with a history, with, with traditions that we yeah. grow up One of which is the respect for other people and as persons as, uh, as a result of growing together, developing together. And, uh, I just wonder whether you think this. Is also relevant to um, issues in ethics and uh, epistemology because questions there presumably begin with the child. Yeah. Maybe as much as with the animal. Well, one of the best developments in epistemology recently has been the growth of the testimony industry, which I think is a very good thing for epistemology. We're attending more carefully than we did before to the question, what is it about the mere fact that someone else tells me that P that gives me the warrant to believe that P? I think that's a crucial question. And too often epistemology in the past has been characteristically individualistic. Um, testimony, and indeed studies of group knowledge, are both ways of getting us away from that individualism. Just a final brief comment. I was interested in that uh, speculation at the end about relatedness with non-human beings. Um, Professors Eleanor Stump and Tom McLeish at Durham um, have drawn attention to the book of Job, 
3841. Yeah. There's a hymn of second person relationship with creation, which is um, uh, which, which may be a bit of a, a field to exploit uh, in the future. Um, that's that. We're drawing to the end of our time for questions now. Um, we have some. We have a break for tea and coffee, and then at 11 o'clock, Rita Carter and Raymond Tallis will be here to debate whether we do or do not have free will. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.